but you know, she and I don't really do anything. Unitarian Universalist Church of Spokane, where our mission is to join together to create a nourishing liberal religious home and to champion justice, diversity, and environmental stewardship in our wider world. Or, as we say in short, to create community, find meaning, and work for justice. We're glad to have you with us. UUCS is a very welcoming congregation, and we appreciate your unique experiences, backgrounds, beliefs, and lifestyle. If you're one of our longtime members or have been here um, for a short time or if you're joining us today for the very first time, we are so glad to have you with us. Um, no one on Zoom today, so I'll skip that part. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this morning, uh, Ben Stuckert and Gavin Cooley, um, today to discuss homelessness in Spokane. And I'll introduce them in more detail um, a little bit later. And I would also like to welcome Lois Packer. She, I saw her right there. Um, Lois is a past UUCS member, recently relocated back to Spokane after an absence of about 20 years. Lois was, a very, was very active in our church prior to leaving, including serving as a trustee and a president of the board of trustees. Um, Lois, if you don't mind standing, if, or you don't have to. But, <laughs> or you can just raise your hand, whatever you want. And also, today is Alan Foster's birthday. Alan Foster, our coffee man. I don't know if he's still back there. Is he back there? Oh, okay. Okay, oh, let's sing to him. Happy birthday to you. Okay, now please take a few moments to greet one another and be sure to say so hello to someone that you haven't met before.
Thank you. Um, two brief announcements. Um, after, our, um, after this service, Ben and Gavin will be joining a panel discussion and lunch organized by our Social Justice Coordinating Council. Um, and in addition to Ben and Gavin, uh, the panel will include one or two formerly homeless women from Transitions and a representative from Compassionate Addiction Treatment. There is also um, an OWL meeting at 1.30 in the RE, what? What at oh, 1230? Um, I don't know. Uh, at 1230 uh, in the RE wing. Um, so you can go to that as well. Um, we now turn from our informal greeting of one another to formally begin our service by lighting our chalice, the symbol of Unitarian Universalism, the symbol of our unity and solidarity, of our openness and inclusion, of our community and individual uniqueness. May this small flame be our offering of warmth to those who are cold and alone and a light to those in darkness. May it be a flame that ignites justice in our world and a beacon of hope to those in need. And may it reflect at least a spark of truth wherever truth has been lost and cast a healthy shadow of doubt wherever truth has been found. Our opening reflection comes from Dean Kuntz. All human lives are so profoundly and intricately entwined, those dead, those living, those generations yet to come, that the fate of all is the fate of each, and the hope of humanity rests in every heart and in every pair of hands. Our first in-service hymn this morning is Wake Now My Senses, number 298. You can access your gray hymnal or the screen, we are singing verses one, three, and five. Please stand as you're willing and able. kindle our candles of care. Each time we gather as a congregation, there are always those uh, who are with us in our minds and hearts and who we want to wrap in our love and care. Let us share a moment in silence, embracing others who are here and here in our hearts and minds this morning. You are welcome to say their names aloud as you are willing. Those named aloud and those embraced in our silence and all those who are suffering elsewhere in our world at this hour, we hold in our community of compassion. We now gratefully give and receive this morning's offering which sustains this community and its mission to the larger world.
I'd like to invite the children up for our time for all ages. Come on down. <laughs> oh, and thank you, Martha, for such beautiful songs. We used to send the children off to Children's Chapel right after our first song together, but when I took on this position, I decided to change that because I wanted you guys to hear all the amazing music that we have in our church. Isn't it fun? Yeah. All right. Well, for today's story, I have a tale that is inspired by a really, really old epic poem called The Conference of the Birds. You may recognize some of the birds on the screen, and some of them might be unfamiliar to you. Once upon a time, all the birds in the land decided they needed a leader for their community. A leader, they thought, would make their community stronger. Representatives of all the bird species gathered together to discuss finding their leader. A leader will tell us the right things to do, said the robin. Our leader must be wise, said the owl. Max, I'd love to hear your thoughts when I'm done with the story. Thank you. A leader must believe we are each important, big and small, said the sparrow. I want the leader to be caring, like a friend, said the dove. Yes, the leader should help us share and get along better, said the jay. The leader must make us feel safe, said the hawk. I know where you can find such a leader, the hoopoe bird said. It is the Samorg who lives far, far away from here. The birds were very excited. They said they were willing to go anywhere to find such a leader. It might be dangerous, said the hoopoe. A few birds looked troubled, but all the birds voted to go to the Samorg. The hoopoe took off, and all the birds followed. They flew at night. They flew in sunshine. Days and days passed. Some birds got tired and left the group. Other birds were filled with doubt. How did they know the smorg really existed? Only the hoopoe had ever heard of this bird. Some of the doubters dropped out, but others kept flying. One valley was filled with fiery mountains. All the birds were very afraid. I'm too small to make it over that mountain, lamented the sparrow. No, keep flying, said the hoopoe. We can make it together. We will help you. And they did. The strong flyers helped the weaker flyers. The birds with good vision helped find food for the group. Along the journey, the birds learned how to better respect, share, and care for each other. It seemed that every bird had something special and unique to offer that made the journey easier. Finally, the hoopoe announced, we are here. The other birds looked around in anticipation. But where's this Samorg? We don't see it, they cried. Come, it's over here, said the hoopoe. The birds stood beside the hoopoe and realized they were on the edge of a lake. They looked in and they saw their reflection. And then they understood. The Samorg was not another bird. The Samorg was all of them, and all of them were the Samorg. They remembered that each of them had something good and strong and special inside them and that each bird had gifts to bring to the community. They were all that was needed to keep the community strong. They knew that together they could do anything. And now please join me in singing our children out to Children's Chapel. As we move into a time of meditation, find a comfortable position, close your eyes if you wish, take a deep breath in, breathe out. Through it all, we attempt to bring balance to the present moment, understanding that in patience lies wisdom, knowing that what will come next will be determined in large measure by how we are now. This is helpful to keep in mind when we get impatient in our meditation or when we get frustrated, impatient and angry in our lives. Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching asks this of us, do you have the patience to wait till your mud settles and the water is clear? Can you remain unmoving till the right action arises by itself?
reading this morning is entitled Just Listen by Rachel Noemi Remen. I suspect that the most basic and powerful way to connect to another person is to listen. Just listen. Perhaps the most important thing we ever give each other is our attention, and especially if it's given from the heart. When people are talking, there's no need to do anything but receive them. Just take them in. Listen to what they are saying. Care about it. Most times, caring is about, most times caring is about, it is, it is even more important than understanding. Most of us don't value ourselves or our love enough to know this. It has taken me a long time to believe in the power of simply listening and saying, I'm sorry, when someone is in pain and meaning it. One of my patients told me that when she tried to tell her story, people often interrupted her to tell her that they once had something just like that happen to them. Suddenly, her pain became a story about themselves. Eventually, she stopped talking to most people. It was just too lonely. We, can, we connect through listening. When we interrupt what someone is saying to let them know that we understand, we move the focus of attention to ourselves. When we listen, they know we care. I've even learned to respond to someone crying by just listening. In the old days, I used to reach for the tissues until I realized that passing a person a tissue may be just another way to shut them down, to take them out of their experience of sadness and grief. Now, I just listen. When they have cried all they need to cry, they find me there with them. The sermon title this morning is Homelessness, Regional Solutions, Housing, and Help. And our um, guest speakers are Ben Stuckert and Gavin Cooley. Ben Stuckert was born and raised in Spokane. He has two degrees from Eastern Washington University. He served as city council president from 2012 to 2019. He is currently the executive director of the Spokane Low Income Housing Consortium. He and Gavin Cooley helped create Housing and Help, a web series of documentaries seeking proven solutions to end the homelessness crisis. I will just say I've seen all the episodes. It's a great primer on 
understand the current state of homelessness in Spokane, and um, it'll really help you sort of get educated about the issue. Um, Gavin Cooley served for 18 years as the chief financial officer for the city of Spokane. He worked for six Spokane mayors and is currently spending his time convincing folks to get together and solve homelessness. So please join me in welcoming Ben Stuckert and Gavin Cooley. Thank you very much for inviting us to speak here today. Um, just a bit about myself before we go on, and I think stories that we, lessons we learn, stories we tell about ourselves are really important, and I guess the first one is, is Lao Tzu really speaks to me with patience because I'm a really impatient person. Um, last week it was, when I woke up, it was minus seven degrees out, um, driving here today with the snow. Last night I was downtown, and I don't know, there were at least 30 people in little nooks and crannies. Um, and that makes me impatient. Um, this is a lesson I've been trying to learn my whole life. When I was 25, I was living in the Bay Area, and uh, traffic made me really impatient, and I would curse a lot at the cars. And I was stuck in traffic one day, and uh, a car pulled up going the opposite direction, and we were stuck in a traffic jam in a little neighborhood in Oakland, and uh, my windows were down. and. I noticed he had a big, huge loudspeaker on the top of his car, and out of that loudspeaker just came patience, patience. <laughs> and I've always thought he was speaking directly to me. Um, I, I have that problem, and that speaks very clearly. The other um, story I just wanted to tell real quick was when I was, uh, I was 22, and your brain's not fully formed when you're 22, and you think it is, and you think you know everything, and I got home one, uh, Christmas um, from college, and I was up, and my dad, uh, I'd never seen him drink one, more than one beer. My dad worked at SNAP, uh, Spokane Neighborhood Action Programs, for all 38 years of his life. He's one of the last people I know that worked the same place. Um, but I never understood why he worked there or what, and he had uh, the Irish whiskey out, and he was pouring himself a shot, which I had never seen. Um, and then I noticed he was crying, and it was only the second time in my life I'd ever seen him cry. And so I asked him what was going on, and uh, um, I think it was 1992, and uh, the federal government had just cut energy assistance for low-income individuals in half. And I was like, that made him cry. Other things I'd seen hadn't, and I wanted to understand, and so I asked him, I just said, you know, what drives you to work at this place and really like his entire life was devoted to that job and that place and helping people and he just real simply put it like we live in this capitalist society and that's where we live and it's a parabola and you know a lot of people are in the middle but people in here have a lot of wealth and people down here you have a certain amount of unemployment like they call three and a half percent unemployment, full employment. And that's because if you actually had zero percent unemployment, wage inflation would crash the whole economic system and it would no longer exist. And so he's like, if you exist in a system that necessarily has to have people at the bottom and you are living in the middle, then it's your moral responsibility to take care of those at the end of the system. And that story is when I try to repeat often so that I live by that, but I think it's really important to have those stories that kind of flow, and so that's why we pay attention, or I pay attention to homelessness and really feel strongly about it. And then I'll let Gavin introduce himself. I've been hanging around with Ben for 10 years, and it's fun to go and do something like this because I learn something about him every single time. And I'm gonna almost speak towards the things he was talking about an intro because his impatience is really an outstanding thing. Uh, I was I came to the city in 2003. It was our first strong mayor, and uh, six administrations since that time. And what is often lacking in government is uh, a sense of impatience to get things done, a sense of urgency. And you never lack that with Ben. Every meeting with Ben kind of speeds along. And the minute you kind of, it becomes non-productive, 
he always conveniently has something else going on. You know, like the minute you start to say the first time you repeat something, you know, he'll kind of squint at you. The second time he'll look at his watch and say, you know, he's got this other you know, appointment he's got to get to and he just runs out the door. <laughs> and it's a wonderful quality because we need to move things along and we're at this point of needing to move along on this particular issue of homelessness. So I'll go back to Ben and he'll introduce housing and help, which if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be involved in it. So I'm really thankful to Ben and this program that he created and that passion that he talked about really brought forward this project that I think has really brought us to an outstanding moment that we'll get further into. So the program, as Shane mentioned, is called Housing and Help. Um, and about three years ago, when politics in 2019, I was running for office and it became about uh, the home houseless individuals in our community. Um, and I, I'm always trying to figure out like, how do you stop otheringness and what does that look like? Um, and when I say otherness, I'll just point real quick to an example. There's a article in the Inlander about the downtown Spokane Library and it's, it's last week's edition. And the implication, first it talks about how the number of houseless individuals visiting our downtown library has increased. And then two paragraphs later they start talking about how there's more violent inc uh, incidents at the library lately and how um, library employees feel unsafe. And then it's finally down later they say, well it's not, they're interviewing people and it's not the homeless individuals creating the violent incidents. But the implication is really clear. And when we live in societies where all the rich people live in big single family homes in areas of the South Hill, and there's no mixed income neighborhoods, and you go to the grocery store and you say people exactly of your income level, or you go to the post office and it's all the exact same people, um, it's really easy to other those people that are different than us or the different socioeconomic status. And we do that a lot, and not just in Spokane, but in our society. And it's easy to blame when there are societal issues, uh, blame them on individuals and not treat them as part of our community. And that's one of the pillars of the, the church here that we talk about. And so my, and I, I was really patient because I had this idea for a PR project and I let it mull in my head before I even mentioned it to anybody for a year until I could clearly articulate what I wanted. And then the first time I mentioned it, the first day I mentioned it to two funders, they put $200,000 on the table. And so it's the first time, instead of just documenting what's going on with homelessness and houseless individuals in our community, we were able to put money towards um, advertising it. And so at the end, we just put out our fifth episode, but we're at almost 100,000 views all the way through the episodes. And the episodes are uh, between 20 and 30 minutes each. Um, and then we've had over a million views on social media of our little 30 second snippets that we've put out there. But what it's also done is really point to um, how we can act together. So instead of just changing minds, like I think we sat down on the first day and said, what does success look like? And to me, success was 2,000 people that think about houselessness different in our society. And the web series is set up to talk about causalities and then really look at houselessness in our community and then potential solutions. And it's set up really deliberately, but I think what we, and it ends with housing and help, and you, you shouldn't be surprised when we say we have an increasing number of houselessness, that the solution is more houses and services. It's not complicated, right? People are houseless, they need, but people act really surprised when you tell them that this is how it works. But, uh, so it's been a success, but I, I think I want Gavin to really dig in maybe to Houston and what we found out, uh, because that's where we really saw a large metropolitan area that made a difference, and I think he's gonna talk really specific about that. <coughs> Houston is the fourth largest metropolitan area in the country and the reason we were drawn to Houston was they had a figure there that no other large metropolitan area ha had anywhere in the country and that's that they've decreased homelessness about 65% over the last 10 years. There's a graph that we have where it shows that Spokane's homelessness population has gone up about the same amount during the same period. It's gone up 
about the same amount that Houston's has gone down. So it forms this perfect X, a very kind of depressing X. And, and so, um, but I want to comment just that the problem with homelessness in Spokane is a result of a lot of our success. As the CFO of the city for 18 years, the fact that our population is growing at about double the rate it normally does, that people are coming here and that the community is growing, that's a, a really positive indicator, at least, for you know, the, that some of the things we're doing right here. It's an attractive area. Our unemployment is low. Our economy is as strong as it's been. The uh, uh, amount of poverty in Spokane has gone down dramatically. The real engine that you see for communities, the, the demographic of 18 to 34 year olds is higher in Spokane now than either Seattle or Portland. And so we've got just a lot of things going right, but we're also being victimized by our success. The housing prices have gone up so quickly and the vacancy rates and the costs of rentals have gone uh, in a direction that we really have this perfect storm for homelessness. Like most successful cities in America, we're experiencing this very difficult problem. So as Ben said, we were drawn to Houston because they had the same problem. They were actually in trouble with HUD because they were doing the housing and urban development. They were doing such a poor job, they were in danger of losing funding. And they started off on a new course. And it's that old thing that, you know, the thinking that got you into a problem won't get you out. Houston looked at a whole new way of doing things. And it would be really tempting, and, and it was tempting as we arrived there, to talk about the individual things they were doing. Like, you want to ask them, like, what are you doing? You know, pallet homes? Is it some change in zoning? What, what, what's the secret sauce? And the three-term mayor there, Anise Parker, insisted that although people really were looking for something more detailed or something more magical, that really all it was was getting all of the parts of the system under one umbrella working in a coordinated fashion. And that sounds really mundane until you're, if you've ever worked in government or even if you think about your own family or whatever large groups and getting a large group of people to come together. I don't know what brought those, uh, those Oahu birds together in the first place. You know, there must have been some di major discord that was happening and you know pain is often our greatest teacher and we're at this extreme point of pain in Spokane with homelessness it, it couldn't get much worse and as a result we're ready to change and that's where Houston was 10 years ago and so they came together and they were really lucky they had a lot of things happen all at once but they had a really strong mayor they had a lot of turnover in other key positions so that this normal status quo was kind of disrupted and they were able to make these really dramatic changes in bringing the whole system together and answerable to a centralized authority that was able to lay out policies and programs and get every all you know the many 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 service providers the uh, philanthropy the business pop you know the, uh, the the business organizations throughout the community the big business the small the medium all coming together to work on this one problem together working off the same strategic plan one plan sharing resources not duplicating sharing data and, and, and working together in that fashion. And so that's how they got those really spectacular results. It's nothing magical. It's just the power of working together. And before I hand it back to Ben, I'll say 18 years as a CFO, I found that when you're working together and sharing information, sharing data, you can always afford to solve the problem. Money is never the problem. It's always a problem of not being able to work together collaboratively, share information, and work off the same plan. That's always the problem. It's never money, which is a strange consideration also. Ben? So I want to just kind of give an example of when I say, like, when Gavin says, get everybody together and work together, that sounds really easy. But if, if you're... Megan's here from Transitions, and if Transitions wants to build more housing, so say they want to build low-income housing or replicate the um, transitional cottage homes they have right off of Northwest Boulevard that are showing great success. They would have to go to the city of Spokane for some money. They would have to go to the county of Spokane. They would have to go to the Spokane Valley, potentially. They would have to go to the Department of Commerce they would have to go through the continuum of care, which gets some of the HUD dollars. 
They would also have to go to the federal government for other funding. They would have to go to individual businesses that want to help. And they would have to go to separate foundations in philanthropy like Innovia or Empire Health Foundation or other. So you got eight different groups that are all wanting to help solve homelessness, but there's nothing in the center holding them together, and there's no plan or goal that those eight groups all agree on. And Houston had the same problem, and they said, we're gonna create, instead of you all out here just kind of shooting off funding, and the timing never works right, or if you're in the case of the city in the last two years, money's getting out there late, um, so it can't even be spent on housing because half of the staff have left because the city has 53 different departments and they're not an expert in homelessness, which is a very complicated issue. So they all said, got together and said, hey, we're going to combine all of our resources into one central organization. And that one central organization is going to have that plan that all of our funding goes towards. So in the last year, um, you have different plans. The city has a consolidated plan. The continuum of care that handles the, the HUD dollars has what's called a five-year plan to end homelessness. Um, and the biggest expense the city did was open a 350-person warehouse out on Trent that has a price tag of about $8 million a year. And that's not in anybody's plan. Nobody said, not a single provider in town said, if you have $8 million, what's the best way to spend that $8 million? We're going to open up a 350-person bed. All the data shows that you shouldn't have a, a shelter with more than 100 people in it, because no matter who those 100 people are, if you put them all in one compact space without running water, without operating toilets, you're going to have problems. It, it's, it's what happens when you take people and treat them differently than community members. But there, there was no central plan that everybody agreed to. So now next month, I think the next year's budget, they used one-time dollars to solve that hole this year. There's an automatic $8 million deficit in the city budget next year because of that plan. And it makes sense, right, from a point of view is when you're bleeding, you try to stop the bleeding. The fastest thing they could do is build a 350 person shelter, whereas Houston said, okay, we're going to gather together and form that plan. Now, and what did Houston, when they gathered together and said, and then showed that they could decrease homelessness by 64%, they all gathered in a room and said, what's the data show? And the data shows that if you build housing and combine your dollars together and focus it, you're going to get much more housing. So they've built over the last 10 years over 8,000 units of permanent supportive housing. And Houston, over that 11-year period, has housed 24,000 individuals. And that equaled a 64% decrease in the homeless population. And you have to, it can't, the word that the federal government uses and people like to throw around is housing first. But that's kind of a misnomer because housing first, what it really means is housing and services. So if you need mental health services, if you need substance abuse services, if you need a case manager, all those are offered in permanent supportive housing, or I like to call it just housing and help, because it's a lot more clear, but we offer a roof over the head where somebody has a door, and you do that, and Houston found that. And the, pr the proof is, it, it, you can go to different countries, and so in 2018, I got to spend eight nights um, when I was with the city of Spokane in Copenhagen. And it was an environmental trip to see what great things they were doing environmentally. But they took you out and wined and dined you because they were trying to basically sell you on their environmental model. But what they did was they made us bike everywhere. And so S Copenhagen is exactly the same size as Seattle, exactly the same population. First night I noticed biking home, there are no homeless individuals in this town. So I started doing my research and I get really bad jet lag, so I'm up half the night. So I started figuring out where are the poorest areas of Copenhagen, and I'd take my bike out every night and go look for a new neighborhood. And in eight nights, I saw five homeless individuals. Three of them had a social worker with them trying to find them housing. And so then you, you go look a little deeper, and you go, okay, what's going on here? 18% of Copenhagen's housing stock is low income or subsidized in some form or matter because they, in their constitution, have written that housing is a right. Spokane, 
about 3.5% of our housing stock is subsidized. So it's not that we can't do it, it's that we're not, and we need to be impatient a little bit and say, how can we combine all of our resources and have better govern governance so that the nonprofits have consistency and have better coordination, and then we can get to those good results where we're combining our dollars and doing it better. So with that, I'll let it turn over to Gavin with where we're at on that, and thank you. So where's the hope in all this? Um, there's a, a really central statistic to all this that really gives a lot of hope, and that is, that in Houston they estimate it costs about five times more to have somebody on the streets than it does to give them housing and wraparound services. And not only that, the cost of housing and wraparound services is l largely federal and state dollars. So it's not even our direct money. We're paying into it, of course, as citizens of America, but it's coming from outside. The five times number are our dollars. So the estimate in Houston is somewhere between ninety and a hundred thousand dollars a year to have somebody on the streets. That's a cost to our local medical providing community, mental health community, to the emergency response system, to criminal justice system, and the list goes on and on. And the cost of housing and wraparound services is closer to twenty thousand. Might be 25,000 in Spokane. Spokane is more expensive than Houston. We're not Houston, we'll do things a lot differently. But that's a wonderful statistic because people tend to come into homelessness feeling either a great deal of compassion or you come into homelessness looking at it feeling uh, a lot of distress about the financial aspects of it. They might have a business downtown that's being affected by homelessness, but people come at it one or the other. But once you point out that statistic, you start to find that people who are fundamentally interested in, say, commerce, start to have, feel a lot of compassion. They realize it's affordable and we can address this compassion issue at the same time. And people on the compassion side, when they're only focused there, they start to see, yeah, it does matter. The, the fabric of our downtown community or the fabric of our neighborhoods is being affected by homelessness. And so you start to have this convergence, which is something we haven't seen much in the last 10 years or so or even longer on the federal level especially but on this local level I'm finding that there is no left and right on homelessness there's people converging in the middle so where does that bring us uh, Shane and others have brought people together to have conversations about this last year and so I think some people here have heard this story or some variation on it and in the earlier stories we were just trying to get the things started just get the conversation started. We saw some opportunities to do what Houston did in our own Spokane kind of way, but we were just getting it started. Monday, I believe, unless something really goes wrong, the city council and the mayor's office will both sign off on a joint statement. The county commissioners, our new five board of county commissioners, will likewise sign off on the same uh, joint statement and Spokane Valley will sign off on that the following day. It's been a long, long time since those three jurisdictions have come together in a meaningful way on a really big issue. And they're all saying the same thing. We're going to take 90 days to talk about what a regional formation would look like. So we'll talk about the legal formation. Is it a nonprofit organization, this big umbrella over the whole homelessness response system? Is it a nonprofit? Is it a public development authority? Is it a contractual arrangement under the Interlocal Act of Washington State? There's a lot of options. And we've got a bunch of lawyers working on this, the, really the best lawyers that know a lot about municipal and county governance are working on this now. And then we likewise need to talk about the finances. And we've got a bunch of people working on the finances at the city, at the county, at the valley, and our own resources. And then we talk about data. And we have data people, the city, the county, and the valley likewise working because we've got to have a very clear picture financially, legally, and from a data perspective, where are the people are that need help, what are the needs, where are the needs, what are the timing. All those things are essential ingredients. And we'll talk about governance. What governance is going to be critical because we're going to have a board of directors or maybe more than one, but we know that we want to get the politics out of homelessness. We saw this with Camp Hope. We want that out. 
But we do need the jurisdictions leaning in, way in, to help with the problem. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the city of Spokane owns over 50% of the real estate in the, uh, in the boundaries of the city, over 50%. When the school bond was run, the 495-2018, the $495 million bond in 2018, uh, we gave the land for three of the schools, the city did. The Attorney General said we couldn't do that. It was a gifting of public funds. We're saying, yes, we can. We can, as a city, give to our schools. And we did. And we can do that again. We can really assist with homelessness. And we have all three jurisdictions leaning in. We can do that. But we're going to be a lot like these birds for a while. You know, where they're up there and the Jay is saying one thing, you know, and they're all arguing about where they're going and what that's going to look like. And there's going to be a lot of argument because anytime there's a big change, and this is a big change, um, there's going to be a lot of concern about how it comes about. And that's a good thing. There's going to be a lot of really sharp debate about how probably over 100 homelessness response organizations, all of them very passionate, all of them doing good, committed work. How do they all now come together and work under one plan, under one you know, financial picture? Uh, how is that going to come together? And there'll be a lot of pushback, and you'll hear a lot of controversy, but we've done it before. Cities spin off and counties spin off organizations all the time. Back in the day, we spun off transit. We spun off animal control. We spun off entertainment facilities that run our Coliseum, the, uh, the entertainment facilities downtown, the convention center, the, you know, all those facilities are not run by the city anymore. Most cities run the school district for a while, and then they spin that off at some point too. This is one more spin off because we need one central organization dealing effectively with homelessness because it's not going away. It's going to be something we have to put in place and have it. We, we're never going to solve homelessness. It's going to be a daily optimal management kind of situation. And so we're going to optimally manage it with the right people all working together. So that's where we are. And so I think you'll hear about it on Monday. Those joint statements will be signed. You'll hear about that 90 day period. And I think you'll also hear about, if you watch it, opportunities for all of you with your expertise and, and, and knowledge of different areas to come together as a community because this is going to be a heavy lift. But I think one that, you know, I think, I, I really believe in 10 years, places, people won't be going to Houston to see how to manage homelessness. They'll be coming to Spokane. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. We have a final hymn today, so please rise as you're willing and able to sing Make Channels for the Streams of Love. It's number 299. strengthens and deepens relationships. It is a bridge over troubled waters, a safe harbor in a storm, a gesture of welcome to a newcomer. Kindness is a balm that can heal the wounds of alienation and isolation. It is a gesture that can put the stranger at ease and disarm an enemy. Kindness nurtures deep connections because it is such a generous act. We don't need to question motives because kindness is always from the heart. Kindness is free. Sprinkle it everywhere. 
Amen, blessed be, salam alaikum, and shalom.